is to develop and support innovative men mentorship opportunities that will inspire and guide the next generation of healthcare leaders. With that being, my name is Vanessa Valencia, and I am the Vice President of Mentorship for Me Mentors Central California region. And then, and then we also have Henry. Would you like to introduce yourself and Melissa? I think you're muted. Can you hear me? Yeah. Hi, yeah. everyone. My name is Melissa Venegas, and I'm a Southern California ambassador for Mi Mentor. Uh, thank you all for being here. We just want to let you know that today we're going to be taking your questions a little differently, just so that your questions don't get lost in the chat box. So the way we're going to do it is if your first name starts with an A through G, you're going to be sending your questions privately to me um, and I'll send a reminder in the chat box right now and if your name starts with an H through Z you're going to be sending it to Henry so I'll let him introduce himself hi everyone um, um, it's a pleasure to be here today with all you guys um, so I'm the, actually the VP the vice president of um, mentorship here in Southern California. So um, it was really, um, it's really an honor to be collaborating with Central Cal team. It's, it's really been, um, um, well, just collaborating with them has made it like, you know, being able to host this event easier. So thank you. And that's pretty much it for me. Okay. So uh, before we start the event, I just want to let you guys know that you will be a post-event survey towards the end of the event. Um, it should take about three to four minutes for you guys to complete and it'll allow us to learn how to do better and what events you'd like to see. Um, and the speaker's contact information will be shared with those who do complete the event. Um, so our speakers for today's event are Sinibaldo, Bianca, Victoria, and Alejandra. Um, my name is Bianca, um, and I'll get into like my introduction in a second. I first wanted to start out by welcoming you. I'm so glad so many of you are interested in the MD PhD program. Uh, and I wanted to share a little bit about like what it is. It's um, a dual degree program where you end up getting both your MD and your PhD. So you're given training in both medicine and research. Um, and historically, it was designed for academic physician scientists, which is what um, you can consider yourself sort of at the end of the full program. Um, but now you can uh, have a lot more flexibility in like what it is that you want to do, whether it is to go on into uh, being a faculty member at like an academic institution or into sort of like private industry, if you choose to focus more on clinical work or running your own lab. It's really cool because you can do uh, so what your PhD is and what specialty you choose. So really the world is your oyster and um, that's a lot of fun. So like it says on the slide here, uh, you can see patients, you can do research, you could do consulting, advocacy, like really, um, again, it allows for so many different types of training. And normally um, the program is set up so that you complete your first two years uh, doing the M MD or MS1, MS2. And those are your didactic years where you're learning about anatomy and physiology and pathology and pharmacology. Some schools will allow you to do your first year of MS1 and then go right into the PhD. Uh, that just depends on the institution. Uh, and we can talk a little bit about like what the differences are and um, advantages or disadvantages later on. After the first two years, you can go into, like I said, your PhD, and hopefully you complete that in four years. There are flexibilities of like, if you need extra time or less time, that really depends on your institution and what you're doing your PhD in. 
um, what sort of work you're trying to get out of those uh, years. Then uh, you can go into your last two clinical years of med school, MS3, MS4, which are really the uh, years where you're in the hospital doing clinical rotations and figuring out what specialty it is that you're interested in. After all of that, so those are your eight years that we're always talking about, um, you can go into your residency, postdoc. It's really um, dependent on what your career goals are. So if you don't want to go into residency, you can skip it entirely. Is that something that you want to do? because you hope to like continue practicing clinically in the hospital or in a uh, private practice again that's something that you could do as well so you can see that there's like so many different computations of how you uh, can really modify the program so what career path you want um, and the last part is at the majority of institutions um, you will get fully funded meaning your tuition is covered and uh, you get a living stipend so some schools are called like MSTP, which is Medical Scientist Training Program. Those schools with that um, name are funded by the NIH. Other schools will be called MD-PhD. That's really the only difference between them. Um, and yeah, so all of that is covered, which is really nice um, as well. Okay, I think that's all I had to say on this slide. <laughs> Okay, so if that sounds like so great and uh, something that you'd be interested in, here's what you need to do to get into an MD-PhD program. So first, you are going to need to complete all of the same prereqs that pre-meds have to complete to get into med school. And I'm talking about like chemistry, OCHEM, like it's all of those courses, they need to be done. On top of that, you do need to do like the volunteer work, um, and sort of that clinical shadowing experience that pre-meds also uh, need. But what's really important is that you show that you're interested in research. No matter what point you're at in your undergrad phase or your undergrad track, um, start research if this is something serious for you and really show why you're interested in it and what it is that you want to get out of it later in your career, why it's so important to you, why, um, this is such an important emphasis for you because really you could do research with just a PhD or just an MD, um, but showing what it is about having both is something that you'll get asked over and over again. Okay, so that's a great way to show like you're interested in it while you're in the undergrad phase. Then you need to take the MCAT. You don't need the GRE. And then going to point three, you'll apply the same way that like other pre-med students apply uh, to med schools through the AMCAS, where you put in like the MCAT scores and your GPA and your personal activities and all of those different things that all of the other pre-meds have to do. But on top of that, there is a couple, I can't remember if it's one or two extra essays that you have to complete about like, what was your research in undergrad? and then why specifically you want to do the MD PhD track, what it is you want to get out of it. That application for point three, the AMCAS, if you haven't heard of it before, it's sort of this um, like one stop primary application that goes to all of the medical schools that you apply to. And it's sort of standardized, every med school gets the same one. For point four, secondaries are specialized to the schools that you have applied to they are sort of like okay you're interested in us now you have to uh, fill out these essays that are specific to our school and for uh, MD PhD programs much like any additional program that you'll do for med school um, you're going to have to write extra essays that say like why should you get into this extra program I didn't think it was like crazy cumbersome. It's just like a couple extra. So that's why I wrote, don't worry about it. It's not too much more. Um, and then for five, okay, so you've completed your primaries, your secondaries, and now the school is like, we're interested in you. Uh, come on down, like we want to interview you. The schools will have you stay usually for more than one day. So for MD applicants, you typically go for a one day long, like interviews, talking to different um, admission committee members and different faculty members and all of this, and sometimes students too. For MD-PhD, you'll have an extra day where you'll talk specifically about the MD-PhD program, and then you'll also um, talk to different faculty members that you might want to do your research with. So anyone who's sort of like 
someone that you might be interested in. And this is really where you can show your interest in a specific institution. Um, you can sort of pick out like PIs that match the research that you're interested in and really show like, I really was thoughtful about this institution because I know I could fit perfectly into this research program and it would tie with this like specialty that I want or you know like some career goal that you have it doesn't necessarily have to be the specialty and then the last part is just like get accepted which is just so easy <laughs> but um okay so that's like a super brief overview and I think we can get more into details as you all have questions that was super fast um so yeah we'll just go like keep going with the introductions and then We'll share more info on all of those little details. Okay, <laughs> so now let me introduce myself. Um, I am Bianca. I'm at the University of California, Irvine. Um, I am a second year, so I chose to do uh, MS1, MS2, and then my PhD. And it's a lot, um, but it's a lot of fun. I I feel like I have to take a breath here because um, I really, really like my school. I'm also a part of Prime LC, which I think a lot of you through Me Mentor are like familiar with, but it's program in medical education for the Latinx community. Um, and so I get sort of the best of a bunch of different worlds. I'm doing community advocacy work. I am interested in neuroscience. You can see that my PhD interest is in neuroscience, but I also did my undergrad in neuroscience. So that's all of that. I went to the University of Pittsburgh, majored in neuroscience, minors in chemistry and Spanish. And then I wrote that I have a, had a very average MCAT, um, really because I wanted to emphasize, like, I've gotten a lot of questions on new info and otherwise, like, are MD, PhD programs, like, crazy harder to get into? Evidently, um, the average numbers tend to be higher for admissions. I do not want that to deter you. And I know that the other amazing speakers that we have today will also encourage you. Um, based on their stats, I've been looking at uh, some of the intros. And I was really worried about my MCAT not being um, helpful in getting into these programs. And really, like you have to remember that because MD PhD is such a flexible, um, intricate program, I feel that you can really make up for any sort of insecurities that you might have in one avenue with showing your strengths in others. And we can get into that more. But I wrote my, um, yeah, my GPA was like, okay. And yeah, my MCAT, like even for my current class, I would consider like on the lower end. And also just going back to the MCAT, um, there's a lot of barriers, I think, around taking the MCAT and getting resources for the MCAT. It is like sort of an expensive process. And um, there are a lot of different like fee assistance waivers and uh, ways to like get around the cost of applications in general. But just like keep that in mind. Anyway, sorry. Um, so for the extracurriculars, I wrote that I served part time at restaurants because this was like a big part of my undergraduate um, like career time, whatever, um, only because this is something that I was doing part time. And I felt like it was important to write here because for any of you that are doing things that are not necessarily like something that you would consider typical pre-med, um, like if you look at the rest of my list, volunteering at a free clinic, doing research projects, community service, like those are all things that are really good for uh, an application. Um, but like you should really be truthful about any sort of work that you're doing additionally because it says a lot about uh, where your time is going and like how much you want this program because you're doing x y and z on top of like all of the other things that you have going on um, in your personal life or otherwise so that's the only reason i put that there just to like sort of encourage you like uh that there are so many ways that you can show that you're an ex excellent applicant by like putting in even the things that you think might not be like typically pre-med. Okay. Um, also, yeah, I did take a gap year. Many of my colleagues have taken one gap year or more than one gap year. It's a really good time to sort of take a breath between undergrad and med school, especially when you're in like a super long program like MD-PhD. And there I was a research assistant 
after that, I also had um, two co-authorships and a manuscript that I had written that was submitted at the time. So again, just like, you don't need to have all of that. Research was just like a really big part of my undergrad career, but it is good to have sort of evidence that you like did poster presentations or oral presentations, um, that you submitted an abstract somewhere. All of those things can sort of build your application. Okay, and then, yeah, my background, I'm originally from Pennsylvania, so I just moved to California this, uh, a year ago. And my mom is from uh, Honduras. She is from like a super impoverished part of Honduras, but like we were super lucky because my mom is a teacher to have spent so much time there over the summers. And it really, I have to take a breath here. It like really uh, molded a lot of what I wanted to do with my professional career because, um, because of health disparities globally, but also coming to California and being able to work in Prime LC, those same health disparities existing between like Latinx communities and others. Um, having that like direct connection to the community has given me so much opportunity in language and uh, cultural understanding that you're able to really make a difference in these sort of places. And I wanted to mention that because I know a lot of you have similar interests in terms of community engagement. And so if you're interested in MD, PhD, you can totally make all of these things work use it to your advantage when you're applying, talk about it, um, explicitly write objectives that you hope to reach through this program that meet all of those personal goals. Okay, and then that's why I wrote It's All About Heart because I know a lot of you um, are super hardworking and brilliant and uh, deserve to be in these programs. So show that, show that you have that interest and show uh, what it is that you want to do with this program. And I think that's everything for me. <laughs> okay, hi everybody, can you hear me? I will guess so. <laughs> yes, we can. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Bianca. Yeah, thank you, Bianca. That's gonna be hard to top off, but um, hi everybody. My name is Sinibaldo, I go by Cini. Um, I wanted to first thank you, my mentor, for putting this together. I think it's a great initiative. Um, and I think this path, as Bianca said, is not really that well known among students that look like us or sound like us. So it's really an honor to be here today and share my path and hopefully um, inspire some of you to at least explore it. So I am an incoming first year medical student at the University of Minnesota in Minneapolis. Um, my research interests are in stem cell biology and regenerative medicine. I am an NIH Oxcam Fellow, um, and we can talk about this during the, the question rounds. But that basically means that I will be pursuing my PhD at the NIH in Bethesda and at the University of Oxford or the University of Cambridge in the United Kingdom. Um, I, did my, I am actually originally from Venezuela um, in a small island called Margarita, and I came to the States to pursue my college education. I went to North Dakota State University in Fargo, North Dakota. And I'm double major and double minor. Um, just like Bianca said, I echoed the same thing. I wasn't necessarily the 4.0, 99% um, MCAT student, um, but I have been extremely driven and extremely passionate about this path. And I think that it is thanks to that that um, I am where I am today. I also volunteer as a Spanish interpreter for a free clinic here in Minnesota, and I continue to do so. I have been involved in research for a very long time. Um, my first research internship took place in my sophomore year in college, and it was in stem cell biology. Then I had a second one my senior year in college at the Harvard Stem Cell Institute in Boston. And then um, I pursued more training after college at the Mayo Clinic as a research assistant like Bianca and then as a postback. Um, I got involved in, with a lot of things. Um, a few that are topical to this discussion are I helped plan a few conferences and I was a leader in various organizations like SACNAS and um, local organizations on my campus. So as you can see, I took six gap years from my undergrad to my MD PhD and I had two co-authorships as an undergrad and then I had 
eight after I graduated college. And I think the key truly is um, perseverance. If this is what you want, um, there, are a, there's, there are a thousand ways to make it possible. Um, I think usually what's lacking is mentorship and guidance on how to make it happen. But if this is what you want, um, even if you're not the ideal candidate, you can always make your application stronger and get where you want to be. Do you have an extra slide, Sini Valda? No, I think I only have that one. Okay, sounds good. Thank you. So I think I'm next, that's correct? Yes. All right. <laughs> Hi everyone, my name's Alejandra. Um, Gallego or Marina Lorena, I go by either. Um, mostly Gallego on social media if you're trying to find me. Um, I am a intern, uh, resident intern at Northwestern right now. Um, I'm in their physician scientist training program, which is basically like MD, PhD, but for residency. Um, so I have already completed uh, the MD, PhD program um, this June, actually. Um, a little bit about me. I grew up in Chicago. Uh, I was raised by a single mom. Um, she immigrated here from Columbia, um, came from a low SES background, first and only position in my family. Um, I'll go through what I went through to get to where I am right now, but I did take the MCAT twice. I had average scores, weak GPA, um, but I had a strong research background, um, just to echo what my colleagues were saying, that you can really, if you really want it, you could really um, get to that point if you just uh, really have some, the passion. Um, so I went to undergrad at Harvard. Um, my major was molecular and cellular biology. Um, I did do a lot of research and I feel like that was um, kind of my strong point. So every summer uh, I, needed, I needed a paid summer job. I know a lot of us do. Um, so I actually uh, applied to the NIH Step Up program. Um, it's basically a research program for underrepresented minorities in science um, and in, in STEM. And so they paid every summer for me to basically do research in a lab. Um, so that's what I did every summer. So I got to do research at Northwestern for a summer, UCLA for a summer, and then at the Jocelyn Diabetes Center, which is affiliated with Harvard. And then I did a senior thesis um, at the Jocelyn Diabetes Center. Um, and then I felt like I needed that time to kind of really decide whether I wanted to do the MD PhD because it is a very long uh, year, very long time, a lot of years. It could be seven, eight, nine, depending how long your PhD takes. Um, and so I needed time to confirm that that's what I wanted to do. And I, I think um, actually having gap year strengthens your application because then they know you're very serious about the MD PhD. Um, pathway. So I did take two gap years. Uh, I participated in the NIH post baccalaureate intramural research program. It's just another way to get some paid research training. Um, I highly recommend it if you guys are interested um, after college to do that. Um, I actually did it at, um, it's, I did it in Phoenix basically investigating um, the genetic basis of diabetes in the Pima Indians of Arizona, so that was really fascinating. And then during that time, I was able to strengthen my application more. I, I did, took the MCAT, I uh, volunteered as a mentor for a nonprofit called the Arizona Ivy League Project, which helped uh, high school seniors uh, try to matriculate into um, Ivy League schools. Um, and I also did night shifts in the in the uh, emergency department as like a helper um, to get that kind of clinical experience. Um, and then after those gap years, I was accepted into uh, the University of Illinois College of Medicine MSTP program, um, which was awesome and amazing. And I love my school. Um, it is a very diverse school, which is, I'm, I'm very proud of. Um, and then my PhD was in microbiology and immunology, 
um, and my PhD was specifically in immunology, and I focused on um, basically immune immune cells uh, um, that help with. Uh, sorry, guys, um, immune cells that basically help with uh, autoimmune disease. Um, and so after that, I graduated on June or May 2020, and now I am in residency. Um, in the physician scientist training program at Northwestern, and um, it's been awesome and exhausting. Um, I don't regret it at all. Um, it's been amazing. And my advice to you guys is just to always follow your passion and don't let anyone tell you that um, you can't do anything. Um, there's a lot of doubters out there, and um, just don't let them get to you. And that's it for me. Thank you, Alejandra. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me all right? Yes, we can. Great. So, hi, my name is Victoria. Um, I'm coming from you from Ann Arbor, Michigan, which sits on the land of the Anishinaabeg um, peoples. And I'm really excited to join this. I only recently joined Mi Mentor and was invited to participate in this panel, which is so exciting, um, especially because um, I get to help represent the non-traditional MSTP or MD-PhD side of things um, and answer any questions that y'all might have related to that. So some background about me. Um, I was born and raised in Arlington, Virginia, outside of DC. My mom is from Mexico, from the state of Michoacan. And she immigrated in her 20s um, to DC, met my dad, who is actually 100% Finnish background. So I'm like this weird mix of Mexican and Finnish, um, which maybe explains why I'm pursuing a PhD in anthropology and an MD in medicine, but who knows. Um, yeah, so my dad uh, was an archaeologist growing up. My parents had six kids and I'm the youngest and I'm the first and only physician in my family, like many of um, the folks who just spoke. And I also did my undergrad at Harvard. I graduated the year after Alejandra um, in 2012. I wish that I had known you, <laughs> to be honest. Um, that would have been really cool. And my major was in social anthropology, um, but I was also doing pre-med coursework at the time and also studying Haitian Creole. Um, I guess my connection to Haiti, I'll explain very briefly. My dad, the archeologist, uh, did research in Haiti uh, since the 1970s. So I kind of grew up learning about the history of IT and went there when I was 17 for the first time and just kept going back. Um, and that's where I do most of my research and have been for a while. Um, but that isn't how I started in undergrad. When I first got to Harvard, I dedicated most of my time to rowing. Um, I was on the lightweight varsity crew team um, and did that for two years until I was actually in Haiti when the earthquake happened. And that shifted a lot of things in my life, um, including me quitting the crew team and dedicating more of my time and energy to um, learning and growing in solidarity with, with Haiti. Um, and that also opened up time for me to engage in a lot more social justice activism, both on campus and in Boston more generally, and get to know the many different communities that there are in Boston. Um, during this time, I was also doing a lot of clinical shadowing and volunteering at the Brigham and Women's Hospital, um, which has kind of a set volunteer program. Um, sorry if my dog interrupts us. <laughs> Um, and uh, doing more or spending more time, like I said, studying Haiti. Um, I did my undergrad major, as I said, in social anthropology and decided to do an undergrad honors thesis, um, which took me to do three months of fieldwork in Haiti uh, between junior and senior year. Um, and I came back and wrote my undergrad thesis and was really just trying to write it as well as I could. And it ended up winning a bunch of awards, including the top thesis at Harvard that year, um, which was pretty exciting. And I'll explain why that matters um, in just a second. But basically all of those awards came with award money, um, half of which I sent back to Haiti. 
um, but also half of which I kept for myself. And um, yeah, during that time, um, I was really set on going straight to medical school right after college. Um, but for a number of reasons, sorry for the background noise, for a number of reasons um, that shifted, mostly because of my GPA. And based on feedback that I got from my advisors there, um, I decided to take a couple gap years. But I was able to, um, I'm really sorry about the noise. Hopefully that will go away in just a second. I'm in my basement. But anyway, so um, my advisors uh, explained that it would probably be better if I took a, a couple years off, or at least a couple years off, or one year off, to try to improve my GPA. Um, so I did two more science courses after I graduated. Um, and I was able to do that using that award money. So that award money helped me pay for the extra science courses and also pay for an MCAT prep course. Bianca mentioned this before. Um, you know, doing the or taking the MCAT and succeeding on it really is, you know, it's there are many, many disparities involved in terms of who has access to those resources. So I was really grateful to have that award money to help me do that. Um, during those gap years, I was also working two jobs as a rowing instructor for a while, while I was also doing an internship in advocacy, um, doing cholera advocacy at the United Nations level, at the government of Haiti level, um, and in various other sectors, um, and doing clinical research at the Cambridge Health Alliance um, with a team of clinicians there who are working with um, Haitian patients in the Boston and Cambridge area who suffer from comorbidities, including diabetes. Um, and then after those two jobs ended, I was desperately looking for employment and reached out to a mentor of mine, um, an undergrad who was Paul Farmer. Many, some of you might know who he is or have heard his name. Um, but he's also an MD, PhD anthropologist and very much inspired my own path. Um, as he's also been working in Haiti for decades around global health. So I reached out to his team and they invited me on to be a research assistant to him, which I did for a year and a half while I was also applying to medical schools. Um, not easy <laughs> to be working like 60 hours a week and applying to medical school. Um, okay, so that's kind of my path leading up to med school. You can ask me any clarifying questions. I know I went pretty quick. And that's a lot of ground to cover. Um, but as the previous speakers mentioned, um, I just want to say a bit about sort of my scores and how that impacted on my application process. Um, so I also had a very average MCAT. Um, like I said, I was like working a ton and doing far too much to really be able to focus on the MCAT, but I managed to pass it and do well enough. Um, I had a generally good GPA, but my science GPA wasn't that great. And I want to spend a minute here to explain like why this is important. So my first years of college while I was rowing varsity, um, I really struggled in science. I really struggled in the transition from public school to Ivy League or college in general. And my GPA in science those first two years were awful. Um, but once I really doubled down and really decided to pursue this MD PhD, um, I improved my science grades and that helped show an upward trajectory um, that really showed my commitment to this path. And I think that's really important that schools definitely pay attention to that. Um, my, I did actually going back to what, how Bianca introduced this, I did need to take the GRE. Um, many MD PhD programs in the social sciences like anthropology, sociology, public health, economics, philosophy, um, and other areas, they do require the GRE. Um, some don't, but many do. So it's important to, if you are pursuing that, to plan on taking the GRE. Um, but what really impacted on my application were my letters of recommendation. 
And I can't emphasize that enough. Like I literally would not be here if it weren't for the letters of recommendation that I had in my application. Um, I applied to both MSTPs as well as MDPHG only programs. Um, I think it's important to note that in most cases, if you apply to an MSTP, if you don't get into the MSTP, you will not automatically be considered for the MD only program. So you have to be strategic um, and think about, you know, where you're most competitive and where you're more likely to get in um, and think about, you know, if you want to apply only MD or both MD PhD. So do your research, get a good sense of where you might want to go and why. Um, reach out to faculty sooner than later if there are people that you'd be interested in working with. Um, and in the case of applying to a non-traditional MSTP, like anthropology, you do want to demonstrate a cohesive project proposal. Um, although once you're in, that can change. <laughs> and it often does. Um, but the programs definitely want to know that you can, you know, explain a project and, and situate it in sort of the broader discussions of the discipline that you're applying to. Um, in my case, I got the answer or got the question why anthropology and not public health or why anthropology and not anything besides anthropology. So you need to make sure that you can answer that question and I can talk about that more during the Q&A. Um, I also want to just let you know that, you know, I'm in my seventh year of the program. Um, so I'm a little ways out from the application process now, but I've seen people applying to programs in the past few years. And at some programs, including the University of Michigan, there's kind of this emerging expectation that people who are applying to the MD-PhD anthropology program should have a robust research experience. Um, some people come in with the master's already done on their application. Um, others come in with like two to three years of research experience. In my case, I was able to demonstrate that based on my undergrad research in Haiti um, and afterwards. But just keep that in mind in terms of like the timing of your pursuit of this, if that's something that you want to do. Um, I ended up choosing to come to the University of Michigan MSTP and anthropology department for many reasons that we can talk more about soon. Um, but one of them was that the administration here, like the faculty um, involved and the director of the program and the financial person on <laughs> in the admins, like they're outstanding. And I knew that I'm pursuing this weird combination of an MD PhD in anthropology, and I need to have a team supporting me and sort of like checking to make sure that you know I'm paying my taxes correctly or that my health care is covered and stuff like that. So I know that they have my back and that's crucial. Um, in terms of residency, I'm considering pursuing emergency medicine. Um, and I don't know, Alejandra, if you know any other MD PhDs in EM, please let me know. Um, but just to wrap up, I want to emphasize how important it is to really develop strong mentorship relationships um you know with your professors pis etc um because they can make a huge difference in your application but ultimately to really follow your joy and your passions mine is in anthropology and i can't imagine doing an md without doing a phd in, in anthropology and it's a huge commitment but i'm so happy to be here and yeah um Feel free to ask me any other questions. I included a couple links up top um, that are provided sort of by the APSA and others um, about questions you might want to consider when applying to non-traditional MSDPs um, and also a list of MSDPs in the social sciences and humanities because there aren't many. Um, usually each year there are about a dozen maybe 10 to 12 programs across the country that offer PhDs in the social sciences and humanities. So you really have to do your research. Um, and even I like called the programs directly before I applied to them just to make sure that they actually have 
or that they actually offer a PhD in anthropology. So it's a lot of legwork, but it ultimately pays off and I'm really, really glad to be here. So thank you. Thank you, Victoria. Uh, okay, so now we're gonna open up for the Q&A. Let me put my camera so you guys know who's talking. Um, so just a quick reminder, uh, we're going to be sharing the speaker's contact information. We just need you to complete our post event survey. Um, it shouldn't take you more than two to three minutes. It's just to learn, like, to get your feedback on what, what worked, what didn't work, um, any other topics that you guys would like to, like, hear about. And, um, yeah, so please just give us your feedback. This helps us a lot um, to become better. So as Vanessa explained earlier on, um, but Melissa and Henry are getting the, your questions through the chat. We also have some questions that you guys submitted upon registration and we want to really address them all. So keep typing your questions in the chat and we'll start like um, answering those. Um, just a quick reminder, or like I guess little advertisement, these are the events that we have coming up with in Mentor. Um, they're going to be more posted, so if you don't have a profile in Mentor, um, you're kind of missing out. Our speakers also have a profile in Mentor, so you can also reach out to them through there. Um, so yeah, so we can um, move on to the Q&A. Okay, so I know Victoria touched on this a little bit, but this question was asked five times. So if any other speaker wants to elaborate, um, can you apply to both ND PhD programs and ND programs through AMCAS during the same cycle? Or how does it work applying to both programs? So I know that um, for certain programs, they will allow you to submit as ND PhD. And then if you don't get into the uh, MD PhD program, you are considered for that med school only. But I, like Victoria was saying, I don't know that it's for all of them. And I determined that by looking on their website whenever I went to like add them onto the AMCAS. So, like when I went to put in my primary application to the AMCAS, before I like chose if I was doing MD PhD or just MD, um, I made sure I went to their website and Calling them is a great idea too, uh, if you're uncertain. And then that way you can decide, is this school somewhere that, you know, I would only want to do my MD if I got in or if I wanted to do my MD PhD? Um, and just make sure you clarify that before you send them in. Yeah, in my experience, um, in AMCAS, once you go to the section where the medical schools are, um, they will have two tabs and it's going to see, it's going to say, I think, MD only or MD PhD. And then also, um, you can apply to both. And I know a lot of my friends who did that also had recommenders write letters for both programs. So some letters said, considering and like supporting his journey for the MD PhD program, and some letters said supporting his journey to the MD, because at the end you can actually select which letters you want going to which school. Uh, so it merits some research on your end, but it is definitely possible to apply to both MD PhD programs and MDs at the same time. Oh, and also um, you could apply to, they're a little more rare, but there are also um, DO PhD programs as well. Thank you. So Henry will ask the next question. Okay, so I have a, um, a couple of people asked this question. Do you guys have any, um, or what's your feedback on DO PhD programs? Sorry, what was the question? DO? Um, there's, um, there's a couple of students that asked um, if, if you guys have any feedback for M or DO PhD programs. Um, yeah, so I know they're a little bit more rare and they also vary in length. None of them are supported by the NIH, like the MD-PhDs or MSDPs. 
Um, and depending on the school, some of them will cover all eight years of your education, and some of them will only cover the MD portion or the PhD portion. Um, so it really depends. Um, I think the advantage is that it allows you to do research in different places that perhaps MD students don't have access to. Um, but those would be the, the, the main differences that I have known so far. So one of the questions that we had during the registration was funding for undocumented or DACA granted students pursuing an MD PhD. So um, I looked up the information for the University of Michigan and on the website for our MSCP, it explains that unfortunately DACA recipients are not eligible um, to, I mean, you can apply, but you're not able to get accepted into the program because it's a federally funded program. Um, but as Bianca explained earlier, there are MD-PhD programs that are not federally funded. So I don't know, Bianca, if you have more information about that, but I just wanted to speak from the U University of Michigan side of things. Sure. So I also don't know nationally. I just looked up uh, the UCI one because you said on their website, it says if you have um, like approval through DACA, you can apply. So I guess UCI is an option. Um, I would again just look case by case basis uh, through like the schools that you're interested in and double check on that. But I cannot, uh, I can't say like blankedly uh, what the answer is to that. Yeah, I would echo the same thing. One of my dear friends actually applied as a DACA student and it did require more research. Um, the other thing to mention is that even though some MSTPs have that designation and they are federally funded, they also have internal grants that help support the MD PhD program. So you could fall into one of those grants that don't, are not necessarily federally granted and they can still support you even through an MD PhD, even if they're not with an age of dollars per se. The next question that we had is, is it necessary, necessary to be published? Um, I guess I can speak on this because I have sat on the admissions committee for MSTPs at UIC. Um, it always helps to be published, but you don't necessarily have to be published, but you have to at least have something in the process or that you, you're showing a lot of research experience. Um, and that's in regards to like, you know, science, PhDs, I can't speak to humanities, um, but you don't necessarily have to be published, no. But have, if you're working on something or uh, you have a lot of research background, um, that's always helpful, but you don't have to be published. Yeah, I would say that holds true for the, you know, social science and humanities side of things as well. Um, just bear in mind that, as I mentioned, there are very few programs available. And generally, those programs that offer MD PhDs in the social sciences and humanities only accept maybe one, zero, zero to six people each year, depending on the school. Um, for instance, at the University of Michigan, I'm currently the only PhD in anthropology, but we accept usually like a PhD in a different non-traditional field, at least one each year. Um, so they're highly competitive. So if you are able to have a publication before, that's definitely a plus. Um, but as was already said, research, uh, you know, robust research experience kind of speaks for that as well. I want to add to that because I think um, mentorship is a key component of this. And so for all the undergrads and postbacs listening to this, when you're joining a lab, I think it's important to set expectations with your PI. Um, and if you're saying, hey, I'm interested in applying to an MD PhD in three years, in four years, in two years, um, part of this process is usually 
either participating or being involved in a publication? Is there an opportunity for me to be involved in, in such an activity in your lab? Uh, and I think it's important to have those discussions because then when the time comes, if you're not involved in a publication, then that's when the conversation should have been had like two years before. So I, I know I made that mistake a lot. <laughs> and sometimes um, you're not included or sometimes you just don't know how to navigate those waters. Um, but I think it's important for you to do that before you join a lab. Um, so that way, if there is an opportunity, um, you can join it, or if you have multiple lab opportunities, then you can pick it um, and use that to make your choices. I also just want to say that um, it doesn't have to be like a first author. You can just be on an author on the paper and it, it it's looked at. Um, I mean, if you have a first author paper, that would be amazing, but that's not necessarily a requirement or even expected. So just being on a paper, just listed. And then I think the biggest thing is knowing what you did for that paper, um, because it, it's very uh, readily apparent if you come to the interview and you're on this paper and you don't really know the research behind it. So it's, it's also knowing the research behind um, the paper that you're on as well. Yeah, I wanted to add on to that too. That made me think about um, my experience in labs. You know, I don't have any family or anybody in my circle that was in like academic sciences or medicine. And so I was so intimidated going into labs. I was like, I'll do whatever you want. Like I'll clean things, I'll like order things, like whatever, like I'll pipette. And that's great. It's great to show like that you're there to help, but like really think about you know, they want you there. And especially if you can get like funded through the summer, I think Alejandro mentioned that, you know, you're free to them and you're available and you're excited. Think about how you can take like a leadership role within the project that you're doing. Like what's a question that you're asking that you're interested in, in the research that you're doing, because whenever it comes time to apply and you show that you're like genuinely interested in your research, like it's going to be so obvious. You're going to be able to talk about like the project and what you did and how you contributed because you were genuinely invested. And I think like that'll make research more interesting for you whenever you're helping to lead it, but also like it'll show on your applications as well. So the next question we have is, is obtaining a master's beneficial for non-traditional students with no relevant research experience or is a research job enough? Awesome, yeah, I tried to speak to that a little bit already um, in terms of sort of these emerging expectations of, you know, on non-traditional MSCPs. Um, I can really just speak from the anthropology side of things. And I would say um, enough relevant research is sufficient. Uh, if again, you can demonstrate your engagement in that and sort of your acumen and your um, just proficiency in, in the case of anthropology, you know, using social theory to try to understand or grapple with a social phenomenon that's going on, whether that's related to health or not. Um, but I would say if you can get a master's in anthropology, um, that's also you know, a big plus on an application, um, but it also varies school by school. Uh, so the best thing you can do is to talk to people who are in that program. <laughs> um, so if you're interested in applying to the University of Michigan, come talk to me. If you're interested in applying you know, to UCSF, UC Berkeley, or Harvard, or Yale, reach out to the MSCP, social science and like non-traditional MSCPs who are there, and find out what their experience was like, because they are definitely the experts in that program and what each program expects from different applicants. Okay, so this question is for Bianca specifically. Uh, how did you apply to both Prime LC and MSDP programs? What is the timeline and what was your experience doing both or what is your experience? Sure, totally. Um, yeah, so I am one of two students at UCI that are in both Prime and MSTP. Um, I just went through whenever I was doing their
secondary application. There's an op I added it to the things that I was interested in because at the time I was like, well, if I don't get into the MD PhD, maybe I could do Prime LC too. And it turned out that after talking to the administration about it, um, that I could actually do MD PhD and Prime. Again, the background for Prime is that it's at UCI, it's specific to the Latinx community. So we do additional courses in like health disparities for the Latinx community in SoCal and um, all of the different barriers. We meet with community members. We go to different nonprofit organizations and talk to them about how they're organizing the community. We see all of our patients um, for like our clinical foundation courses, which is like our uh, how to be a doctor courses in Spanish. So like all of the actor patients that we work with, we see them in Spanish. And then our uh, clinical experiences for first and second year are at uh, clinics that see primarily Latinx patients. Okay. So yeah, I, during the secondary application, I mentioned that um, I wanted to be in Prime LC. I had to write an extra essay as to like what my background was and why I wanted to be a part of it. Um, this is something that I am sort of tying as like a thread through my medical school uh, interests, like my, my medical specialty, but also in my research, um, thinking about how health disparities affect like neurodevelopment is something that I'm very interested in. And that's sort of how I tie the neuroscience with um, Prime LC. It's not an additional year. So for Prime LC students, they typically have to do the four years plus one for their master. Instead, I'm doing the PhD, but I get to be a part of all of their amazing events, including the course that we get to take this extra, all of this um, medical Spanish training, and all of these different events. So, yeah. Thank you. And the next question is for everyone. What would you recommend for older applicants who want to pursue an MD-PhD program? And how successful are students in post back programs in getting accepted to these programs? Um, yeah, I would say I'm, I think I'm a lot older than a lot of my classmates and a lot of the applicants that I met on the interview trail. I think it, um, I mean, I don't know how much older, but I think if anything, it gives you a, a different outlook on life and you bring a different kind of diversity to the medical school class and the PhD class. And I think if you can convey that, um, it's a plus. Um, it gives you an advantage in a certain way. Um, for the postdoc question, in my experience, when I interviewed last year, I think for every single interview, there were only like two students who were coming straight out of undergrad. Everybody was either working as a research tech, doing a postdoc, or doing a master's. Um, so I think at least in my experience for MD PhDs in the sciences, it's a lot more common for people to take time off and then apply to any PhD programs or MSTP programs. I wanted to add real quick, um, if you are looking for other students who apply or got into the MD PhD program later, if you're on Instagram, you can find people that are like non-traditional students that are doing like any kind of um, like extra MD plus whatever program. I use that as sort of like a place of inspiration because they tell a lot of their stories. So if you like look through different hashtags, I'm sure it's on Twitter too, I don't know, I'm not on Twitter, but I know on Instagram that you can find people like that. So um, I think it does go to show that like, it's really about like who you are as an individual and not like all of the stats. Like if you feel like you can bring something to the program, then that's all you need to focus about. Like whatever your the rest of your background is like don't don't let that hesitate you from trying like don't let that stop you from trying because like you don't you don't know i would just like to say that um just being on the admissions committee before when we see like maybe an, an older applicant or an applicant that took some time off you know we're really just looking at what they did with their time and why they're applying now. Um, if it was just like gap years, like what did they do during that time? And you know, what did they publish or what, who were they working with? 
And then if there, it's like a later applicant, like what made them decide that this is what they wanted to do? Um, I don't see it as a negative thing. I see it more as a positive thing because you took the time to really decide and really work towards this goal. So I don't think it's a, a negative thing. And I think it's um, actually looked upon um, highly. Um, and I think, I don't think age should stop you from applying to this program. I do. I do know it's a long program and if you're okay with them, that's fine. But like, you should follow your passion. If this is what you want to do, you should do it because you don't want to regret that later in life. I don't have anything to add, so you can go to the next question. Well, also, um, sorry to interrupt. Um, I wanted to mention, because I don't know if we have mentioned this um, today, but you can actually apply to NDPHC programs as a medical student. So you can actually get into programs, go through your first year of medical school, and then at the end of your second, well, at the beginning of your second year of medical school, you can apply uh, and then join the MD-PhD program. There are some logistics about what happens to the debt and the stipend from that point on. Um, and you can also do your PhD somewhere else if that institution doesn't have an MD-PhD program. Um, so just keep that in mind as well, that that's a different path that a lot of students take too. Yeah, Cindy, thank you for adding that. And I just want to um, expand upon that a bit because there are also opportunities, at least in the social sciences, like there are many cases of people who finish medical school and then do their PhDs um, in anthropology or public health or whatever it might be. So this path can look different in so many ways. Um, there are definitely advantages to pursuing, you know, a funded MD-PhD program because that pays for medical school and a living stipend. Um, but if you're really passionate about this or realize, you know, halfway through medical school or after medical school that you want to pursue a PhD in public health, anthropology, history, whatever it might be, that happens all the time. So again, reach out to, you know, people in that field. And we're always happy to connect you with people who have done that to help you along that path as well. So I have the next question. So this question is, is it true that you, if you pursue an MD, PhD degree, you spend more time doing research and less time seeing patients? Yeah, I think um, that's up to the person who received the MD, PhD. Um, I know a lot of colleagues who ended up pursuing just a clinical practice after their MD-PhDs. I know some people who stop medicine altogether and are just doing research. And I know some people, even the people who are doing research and medicine, do it to different degrees depending on the specialties that they choose to pursue. Um, I think at the end of the day, the MD-PhD gives you the tools to do um, whatever you want. If you want to do research, you can. If you want to do clinical practice, you can. If you want to do clinical research, which is a whole different area, you can. Um, so I think what it gives you is the critical thinking um, to integrate research into um, your clinical practice if you decide to. Um, however, it's not mandatory. Um, the idea is that you have tools to do so. But I also know many colleagues who, after the eight years, they realize that that's not what they wanted to do with their lives, and that's completely fine. Okay, so we had somebody that, that asked advice for a reapplicant. Um, I guess I can talk about this because I've seen this happen before. Um, just general advice, I guess, for a reapplicant is, you know, do you know what kind of things you needed to work on on your previous application? And is there anything actionable on that that you can work on? Um, for example, if it was your GPA, sometimes that's hard to fix in one year. So then you have to strengthen another part of your application. So it's really about seeing what you can work on and then what you can improve on within a year. Um, 
depending, you know, maybe you take more time, um, which is fine. Um, but it's just making progress and showing improvement. If it's your MCAT, then even just showing like an improvement in your MCAT, like two points or something, just shows that you're dedicated to this and that you're willing um, to do what it takes to, to, to pursue this program. Um, if it's research, just like dedicating full-time research or getting a publication or working on your independent project. Um, if it's lack of like, clinical experience, it's really just trying to figure out like what was lacking in your in your previous application. And it's totally okay to reach out to your previous uh, institutions that you apply to and see where you can improve. And I actually think that's a good thing to do because then you know what you need to work on and it shows maturity on your part, knowing that you're willing to work on whatever you need to. Um, that's the only advice that I have. I'm sure the other applicants have some, some more. Or not. I feel like you really covered it. Um, and I felt like since you sat on an admissions committee that you're probably best to, to address this. Um, but yeah, actionable items. Uh, if you can, like try to tack on more research or be more specific about why you fit into like a given institution's program. Like I think that it's really helpful if you can um, really articulate like, okay, your program offers this research, this like extracurricular, this club or some interest, interest group that you're going to like bring something to the table, like some population that they work with specifically or whatever it is. And then seeing what your strengths are and playing them to exactly what that is. And I think like when we were talking about, you know, selecting the schools that you're applying to, don't just like drop a huge list of places that you think you might want to go to and then throw a million applications out there. Really be like specific about, okay, um, I can actually see myself doing research here because of these concrete reasons. And that'll save you more money in the long run because you want to just apply to a million schools and lose money on all of them. <laughs> yeah, if I, I, I totally agree with Bianca and Alejandra, and I know a few of my friends did have to reapply. Um, it's not the end of the road. There's this stigma that if you don't get in the first year, you're like doomed forever. Um, I know a lot of schools actually look at it favorably because you took the time to apply twice to the same school. So it shows commitment to the path and to the school. Um, I think uh, I really agree with Bianca. Sometimes it's necessary to reevaluate the, the schools that you apply to and perhaps, you know, maybe looking into either different kinds of MD programs, different kinds of MD PhD programs that are not MSDP funded, or perhaps even looking at DO programs, um, depending on what you need to, to, to address based on your application. And I think it's also important, um, and a lot of times I think Alejandro said it, um, is, um, addressing what you learn in that year that you are reapplying and how basically why you are a different applicant this year than last year and, and how you enhance your application is important to show as well. Okay, so the next question is for everyone. Did you ever lose motivation during your MD PhD program? How did you find the resilience and balance to complete an eight year program? I guess um, I can start. <laughs> Maybe Alejandro, you have some more to say as well because you have actually completed it and the rest of us are still in the midst of it. Um, yes, so I think this past year has been the hardest on me, um, whether that's because of COVID-19 and all of that added stress, or you know, this is just widespread and the violence of systemic racism in this country that's just like bearing down on all of us. Um, and our friends and our family and everything. Um, but yeah, this year has been really hard um, to keep up the, mot the motivation. Also just not having access to campus, in my case at least. Um, I'm not allowed to go to my office um, or go back to the department. So I have to work from home and that's been really challenging. Um, but I'm starting to feel the motivation come back. So <laughs> I would say there it ebbs and flows always. 
Um, during medical school, so just backing up, during medical school, like taking those two gap years off really helped me re-motivate myself to get back into school. Like when I went to medical school, I was so excited to be back in school and that really helped. So again, like gap years have advantages in so many ways and I think that that's one of them. Um, by the time that I was transitioning to the grad school side of things, I was so ready for grad school. Like I was like, give me a book, I'm ready to read it. <laughs> Put me back in the seminar classroom. Like I wanna, you know, have super heady conversations about, you know, French philosophy. Um, and that was, you know, just again the motivation. So there it's interesting, this this path in this program sort of has built in periods of time where you go through these transition periods and kind of reflect on why it is you're pursuing this. And I think that allows for, again, like digging down and like finding that motivation again. Um, but, you know, as I'm in the fifth year of my PhD program and really just in the isolated phase of writing, it's been really difficult. Um, but I'm starting to prepare to transition back to medical school and that's really exciting. So. Yeah, I think that um, those transition periods help with motivation. You know, talking to your advisors really helps. Having that mentorship and having that support, I think really helps put everything in perspective and helps remind me, you know, what my ultimate goals are and what I want to accomplish with these dual degrees. And that always helps. Um, I don't know if anyone else has anything else to add. I will just echo everything you said because that totally resonated with me. Um, it really just, it does ebb, there's ebbs and flows, right? Um, and these transitions, I guess, were motivating to you. And for me, they were very stressful. And um, because there's transitions like every two, three, four years. So it's like two years and you're working very hard and you're getting really good at something. And then now you're in the PhD and you know nothing again. <laughs> and then you're starting from new. And then you you do the PhD, you become an expert in something and it's great. And then now you're in clinical wards and you're like, I know nothing again. And now I'm a resident and I'm an intern and I know nothing again. So um, it was very hard. Um, the transitions were just always very hard for me. I think the first transition from um, M2 to PhD was hard based on possibly like my mentor choice which is why it's very important to find a good mentor in the end it worked out for me um, but you have to find that good fit during your mentor phase um, and but I'm also very fortunate with the the program that I chose because I was with my people and and they were very helpful during these moments of stress um, so it's also very important to find a program that is very supportive of you and like the leadership is very supportive and they always have your back and that's another thing that we can discuss later about advice about choosing um, MD PhD programs but yeah there were there are moments of of low motivation um and then i guess the way i pushed myself was like i a i i felt like well a i had no other choice like i i already i'm just the type of person that doesn't quit so i just like have to keep going so i just kept going until it got better and then it's fine um and also i just thought of like my mom and everything that she sacrificed for me to be in this position and it, and then she like suffered through so much more than I did where it's like raising four kids on our own with like no salary and I'm like I'm fine <laughs> like I can get through this um so yes it definitely happens it's a long program um but you you do have to find that like motivation within yourself um and also just like take care of your mental health um I also think that it's a very long program and um it's very important to seek therapy if you need it. And I sought therapy in um, my PhD phase because I had time and I'm not ashamed of it. And I think it's, it's, I think people should uh, reach out to people if they need it. Um, so I, I got through it guys. I, I'm, I'm, I'm surviving. <laughs> so it, it works, but uh, it does happen. Um, 
I wanted to I wanted to add on that. Even though I'm in my second year, so like I cannot speak to you know how it's going to feel in like five years um, or six. But I've sort of well, first of all, I also sought therapy. I'm also not like ashamed of it at all. First year, I was like, this is a lot. I need to have like someone in my corner, like helping me out. And it, oh my gosh, like it's such a big transition. You work so hard. You're like, I'm. I just need to get to med school, and then it's gonna be fine. And it's like, it just starts, like, that's just the beginning, the, the, this idea of like, getting in med school and like everything being complete, like, yeah, there's the relief that you're there, but then you now need to do all of the work. And it can be stressful. I now have been able to cope a lot better by thinking like, you know, especially being an M1 and M2, you're with the other medical students who are not in an eight year program. You do not need to be operating at their level. Like they, in a lot of ways, because they're into clinicals, there are extra, Chris, for example, or extra things that they're trying to get onto their resume that you don't necessarily need to be focusing on because you're in it for the long game. Like I'm just really trying to um, pace myself when it comes to like ingesting all of this material, being curious about learning, being curious about my PhD, you do get a little bit of blowback. I don't know if this is just like at my school, but um, I've had multiple M medical students that would really like question why I would do such a long program, not even in like a rude way or anything, but just being like, I could never do that. You're, I believe you're doing it for that long. And for like, I wouldn't have it any other way. And sort of just thinking through like, okay, how do I pace myself through? So much information, so much competitiveness, so much like excite, like excitation around like the idea of learning things and, and taking care of patients. So I would just say if you are getting into a program like this, like this is my lifestyle now. I don't think of it as like, I only have two more years and then I'll be in this phase. I just think of it as like now I am this age and I live in California and like I'm learning this thing. Um, and I think that helps instead of having check marks of like the years going by. Yeah, I haven't even started. So I, <laughs> I can I can contribute to, to the pain of the transitions or how hard it's going to get, but I heard it's going to get, you know, challenging really fast. Um I did want to change to share an anecdote. Um during one of my summer internships, I talked to a clinician scientist and I was asking him about uh, the MD PhD path. And he looked dead into my eyes and said, I don't think you will ever become an MD PhD. Um, so I just wanted to share the story because I am currently an MDPhD student and I think it's important because sometimes individuals have notions and they have um, their own opinions and I think you have to take them as, as that, as an opinion. Um, if you think there is some constructive feedback within what they're trying to say, um, then take that and, and, and evolve as an academic and as a person with that. And so what I gather from that is you're not there yet, and it's going to take you a lot of hard work to get there, which is what I did. Um, but that's a very different mindset from I'm never going to be an MD PhD because this X person said so. And this is even more important because in a time of social media and Instagram and, and all of those things, because we're all different and we all come from very different backgrounds. And sometimes we get advice from people who are not in admissions committee who are trying to give you advice about like admissions. So just, I mean, as future scientists, as future clinicians, um, look at the data objectively and try to find, um, you know, everything with a grain of salt, do your research, talk to people, look from different perspectives around the same problem. Um, and ultimately, if this is what you want to do, you're gonna make it happen one way or another. Um, so that's my experience so far as an M1. I can also say that someone told me, well, first they said I would never get into Harvard and I was like, okay, fine, but I did it. Um, and then when I was at Harvard, they told me I wouldn't get into an MD PhD. I wouldn't get into a med school, let alone an MD PhD program. That was one of my mentors at Harvard, not mentors, advisors. Um, and I was like, okay, cool. Um, so 
people are going to say things to you all the time. And I totally agree that you just need to take the constructive criticism out of that, but don't take it um, for what they're trying to, what they're saying. Um, I think it contributed to a lot of imposter syndrome. So try not to let that happen either. Um, and uh, yeah just believe in yourself. And the person who believed in myself was my mom. And she always said like, you're gonna, you're, you can do this. Don't listen to them. And I'm like, but, but, um, but I believed her and I kept on going and it's fine. And look, I'm, I'm out of it already. Like I already graduated. I graduated in seven years. I got NIH funded during my PhD. Like, oh, also someone said I wasn't gonna get NIH funded either. So it's like, people have these stupid notions don't listen to them. Just take the constructive criticism and move on. Yeah, and in doing one of my interviews, funny enough, um, one of the program directors told me, just look at your CV or, or what you have done, and nobody can take that away from you. Nobody will ever take away your grades, your publications, your hard work. And that to me was like game changing. But he said, you know, this is yours and it will be with you forever. And it goes both ways. If you really put in the work and the research and the time, um, you will make what you want. And vice versa, if you don't put the work, if you slack off, if you are not focused, um, it will also like burn you. So I think it's important to know that you can do, you can do whatever you want, honestly, um, as long as you stay driven and, and passionate and, and you have the right mentorship and network behind you. Okay, so another question that we have is, how will the application process and the MD-PhD programs change due to COVID-19? Yeah, I'll, I'll talk a little bit again. I'm sorry if I'm talking too much. Please feel free to like shut me up if necessary. Um, I know for a lot of MSTPs this year, um, the interviews will be taking place in a virtual format. No students will be coming to campus. And I think that's pretty universal across most MSTPs. Um, for the application per se, a lot of them asked how did COVID impact your studies, for example, and I'm anticipating that that will come up a lot during the interviews. Um, and I think that's um, the main difference. And I think that matters. And I don't know, again, if we mentioned this because um, interviews are very expensive. Um, you have to plan to travel, to stay, food, um, suits, shirts, uh, dry cleaning, etc. cetera. Um, so hopefully this will decrease those costs and allow people to, to participate in more interviews. Uh, Follow-up question on that, Senior Mando. Did you get to do any virtual, since you're a rising MS1, did you get to do any virtual interviews? No, um, I was in person, but most of my second looks were virtual. I do have a, a friend in my cohort that did a, a few um, online interviews by accident because of some logistic issues. Um, he told me personally that um, he didn't think it was that different. Um, if anything, it was an advantage because again, he didn't have to spend all that money and it was kind of quicker. Um, so the only difference I think is that you won't really get a feeling for the place um, and some aspects like the city, for example. Um, but overall, I don't, I don't think it will be that detrimental to the applicants. And just on that note, um, I want to reemphasize the importance of talking to other MSTP fellows in whatever programs that you are applying to, because as you won't get the feel sort of in person of the program, like you want to talk to as many people in the program as you can. Um, oftentimes you can just email like the administrative assistant in the program and that person will connect you to whichever fellow they think is most relevant um, or could be helpful to you. Or you could, you know, go onto the website and look at each individual fellow and sort of cold email them. Um, but yeah, I would really encourage that because that's gonna be really critical in the year ahead.
Okay, so the next question is what MD PhD should someone pursue if they want to get involved in clinical research? And also, could you please elaborate on what clinical research is? Yeah, I, I can talk a little bit about it. Um, to my understanding, clinical research has to do with the uh, um, enhancement of clinical care. So when it comes, for example, of the sciences of clinical trials or drug testing. Um, and that's a little bit different because a lot of MSTPs or MD-PhDs in the sciences focus on molecular mechanisms. So all the way at the other end of the spectrum of patient care. Um, I don't know, to be quite honest, if you need a PhD to do that kind of research. I know for a lot of MDs, they offer specialized masters at the end of the MD that you can do during residency that train you to become equipped to carry out that type of research. In fact, if I'm not mistaken, during medical school, you can do some sort of clinical research. Um, for example, um, I think they call like case studies or stories or retrospective studies. Um, so I think with a master's, you can participate in, in clinical research, but I am not um, that familiar with it. Uh, yeah, thank you, Simi. Uh, they agreed. I, you don't necessarily need a PhD to do that. You can do it with an MD. Uh, many institutions will offer a master's program between like third and fourth year uh, that you could go ahead and do like a master's in clinical research like techniques for example um, that would equip you and get you like started on doing that kind of research really phd i had like a pi uh say to me this to me over the summer while i was doing like a lab rotation uh he really emphasized how the phd is really your opportunity to take that super deep dive into a topic that you don't get time to do in the md into the hospital like the track Right, because as you're going through med school, you really only have like summer after M1 into M2 is like your break and it's up two months. And then you're jumping right off into the rest of med school, residency, and so on. And so you're not really given that time to sit and ask intricate questions that you're curious about. And so if you are interested in research where you get to go like, down to the molecular level, or if you're in humanities, or if you're in social sciences, and there are topics that you really, really want to investigate uh, deeply, this is the time, this is the program that you can do that in. Where with clinical research, like you would understand how it affects the body, like how for a drug, for example. If you're interested in studying like a drug trial, there is a drug of interest, you would be working on how, uh, how well this drug is like effective in your patients that would be happening in your clinical research the basic sciences side would be studying the mechanism of action like on the molecular level of that drug so that would be at the phd so basic sciences would be like sort of where you're at um so i don't know if anyone wants to add on to that but that's sort of like how i think about it i'll add on to that um i've always viewed the phd as just like gaining the skills that are necessary to become uh, an investigator. Um, I would say that MD-PhDs are viewed upon highly because we have this research background that we, you know, did a deep dive um, during the PhD, and we also conducted our own independent research, so we know how to run these um, experiments and investigational processes. Um, so you can, and this gets into a whole other question of like, you know, you can be an MD and still do research and you can do an MD PhD and still do research. Um, so why do the PhD, which is a question they ask um, on the interview trail all the time. Um, a, you know, it's really gaining that experience in the PhD, learning how to fix your experiments, learning all the biases, things like that, and deep diving and becoming an expert in something um, for the PhD. And then after the fact, if you want to stay in academia, which are those big universities, you have to get grant funding. Um, and I think, I think it is a little bit 
easier to get grant funding when you're an MD PhD because they have the faith in you that you can carry out these experiments because you've had this you have you have the publications during your PhD and you have your own um, you've had your own investigative uh, experiments and so it's just very helpful in that regard if you're going to continue in academia and you could do clinical research um, even with an MD PhD um, and I actually think you'll get more funding that's just my opinion but maybe other people can can chime in on that um, but I guess in, in, in essence, it's like, yes, you can do clinical research. You could be an MD. You can be an MD with a master's, or you could be a MD, PhD. Um, but it's just really dependent on, you know, what you want and, like, the experience you want. And, and I guess some of the benefits of getting that PhD uh, in, in the latter half of your career. Yeah, I'll just, you know, echo everything that was just said. Um, and at least from like the non-traditional side of things in social sciences and humanities research world, um, there's often this, you know, perception that um, if you're interested in doing, if you're, if you're passionate about health, health disparities, then you need to do a PhD in epidemiology or anthropology to actually be able to do that research. And that's not the case whatsoever. Um, I would say much of the research when it comes to health disparities or social determinants of health or anything like that is being led by MDs um, who may have a master's but not necessarily have a PhD. So that doesn't necessarily speak to all clinical research, but there is you know, a robust literature of clinical research that focuses on health disparities and the social determinants of health. Um, so again, as was said before, like really try to understand why you're pursuing the PhD um, for the social sciences and humanities that often includes uh, definitely academia <laughs> and a professorship. Um, so you're expected to teach classes, you're expected to publish papers, you're expected to write books, and you have to want to do that if you plan on pursuing it. Like, I can't wait to write a book. I can't wait to teach. I love teaching. Um, so that's a big reason why I want to get this PhD. Um, going back to the clinical research question in particular, there are also emerging areas, um, emerging departments at various universities around the country that offer kind of clinical research specific PhDs. So just keep doing your research as you're pursuing it. Um, at the University of Michigan, for example, they just started offering a PhD in health infrastructure and learning systems. Um, so really interesting stuff, but you know, all of this is emerging. So again, do your research, talk to the programs directly. And even if there is a topic within clinical research that you're really passionate about, you could even reach out to the program directly and explain what you're interested in, and they can maybe give you advice about which you know, area of the university um, you might be interested in applying to for your PhD as well. So I have the next, uh, is that, will that be the end of that question? Okay, so the next question is actually directed for Bianca. So um, there's a student that's interested in neuroscience uh, PhD program. So she's our, uh, he's asking, what helped you the most in finding MD PhD programs that offer neuroscience as part of it? And if you are interested in doing hum human neuroscience research, are schools less readily available to offer help since it helps? Like majority of neuroscience programs are focused on cellular, cellular and animal model research. That's a great question. Um, I found that there were a ton of schools that had neuroscience generally. Uh, it's a pretty popular topic. So, but to get to your question about human neuroscience research, it really depends on what you're doing. I, I am interested in like human <laughs> neuroscience research. Um, 
I, my last project over the summer was learning how to use fMRI. All of the data was based in human subjects. That was in like hippocampal neurodevelopment. Um, in the case of like other research that I'm interested in, next summer I want to do a rotation involving uh, like neurophysiology, so like electrophysiology and recording electrodes from the brains of uh, human patients that have had electrodes implanted um, for like epilepsy uh, treatment, but now doing like memory studies with them. I think, but this is like really, really specific examples of this, right? And this is at one institution. I, for me, it was about like literally going on the website of the, of the institution, looking up the PIs, reading through their research and saying, do they have stuff that I think is cool? And if the answer is yes, then I'm going to apply to this school. Um, there were a ton, like, I, I don't know, I found a lot of institutions uh, that I really liked. I actually almost went to University of Illinois, Chicago, just like Alejandra, which is really funny. It was a great, great school. It was awesome. Um, so consider that one. <laughs> um, but there are a lot, a lot of programs. So more broadly to take your question and like apply it more generally. Just read the PI's little like synopsis of their labs. Make a list of the different labs. Actually, I remember some schools even asking me who are the PIs that you are interested in and why. So like you have to do it anyway. So just start with that. And in that regard, I, I know we were talking about like, a, uh, you know, don't just like apply everywhere. Like it's really hard to read up on everyone's in research interests at every institution. So that just makes your, um, I mean, apply broadly, obviously, but um, read up on where you're applying, what they require. I know my institution has like a completely separate application or it used to, I don't know if it still does, but I'm pretty sure that you have to actually like download something, I'm not sure. So like really dig into the places they are applying to, um, see what the research they're, they're, they have, anything that interests you. And then, and also just from uh, the science perspective, like you don't have to know that like, I wanna do neuroscience. You could just generally be like, I like this right now. Like you don't have to decide right now what you wanna do in seven years. And I've already changed. Like I went in thinking I like diabetes research, which I know it is really cool, but then I ended up liking immunology and now I'm like into autoimmune cancer related research. So um, it can change, it probably will change. Um, so just like, you don't have to hold yourself to one thing and, and Honestly, as much as the research is important, the biggest part of the PhD would be getting the right mentor. And that was really important to me too, where it's, I would, I would have rather like sacrifice, cause we're scientists, right? Like you can get interested in anything. Um, it's really just a matter of getting that right fit and that mentorship that will tell you, that will lead you into like this next phase of your career. So um, just think about that also when you're applying and you're interviewing, like do you have good connections with your cohort because you're gonna be with them for seven, eight years. Um, and you know, sometimes there's these transitions where um, you start medical school with a medical school class and your MSTP class and then your medical school class leaves you and you're only with your MSTP class and, and like there is some like sadness to that and then you're still in like your PhD and then that med school class graduates and they go to residency. And like when I graduated medical school, my medical school class had already finished residency and they're attendings right now. So there's all these things that back these emotional ties that factor into uh, making sure that you have the right environment for you and making sure that the MSTP that you're choosing when you're interviewing, it's it's both an interview, they're interviewing you and you're interviewing them. Just remember that during that process and that like you need to uh, assess how you fit in to them and then how they fit with you. So just remember all that. <laughs> So we had somebody ask, 
Um, how to make my application for MD PhD program stand out as a disadvantaged applicant slash person of color. I think um, the name of the game is research. Uh, these are research heavy programs. You have to show that you know what you're getting yourself into. Um, additionally, you could get some role models that could inform the decisions you're trying to make, and those will evolve into letters of recommendation from current decision scientists that support your journey. Um, as a underrepresented person myself, luckily there is um, a lot of resources for us to explore these paths. So they have discussed a lot about um, summer internship programs. There is a lot. Um, all you have to do is your research. Um, there's also post back programs. And luckily for us, nowadays, these are paid opportunities. So you get a stipend. Sometimes you get money to move to these locations to do the research. Um, so that's where I would start for sure. Um, make sure you know what you're getting yourself into and this is what you want to do. Um, also, if you have the opportunity, talk to current MD PhD students. If you are in a school that has a medical school with an MD PhD, um, then do your research. So for example, when I was a postback at Mayo, they, I joined the weekly MD PhD journal club because I wanted to see what the current students were doing, what it felt like, um, and just to mingle. And that was useful in two ways. One, because it really showed me that that's what I wanted to do. And two, because I got this network of people that really helped me during interviews and when I was writing my essays. So I think doing your research and expose, getting exposure into what research means um, can only benefit you. Either, even if at the end that's not what you want to do, it will only benefit your career. Um, I guess I, I applied as a disadvantaged um, applicant and low SES applicant. Um, I would say that, you know, when I was on the admissions committee, there weren't that many disadvantaged applicants. So you're already in the minority, um, as well as uh, underrepresented minorities, you're already, <laughs> there's not that many applicants. So you're already in the minority there. So it's a matter of, you know, making sure you have the research, you have the grades, um, and that's not to say like you need the amazing grades, but you just have to show that you've been, you did the best you could. Um, and that like, it's above a certain threshold. I know we at UIC looked at applicants comprehensively. Um, and so also if there are deficits in your application that you explain it somehow in your personal statement um, so that we know like, why your MCAT was the way it is or why this or that, like, were you working like this job and that job and made it very difficult for you to focus or study or, you know, maybe you can't afford the um, Kaplan courses or things like that, you know, so like, don't shy away. I know there's a question on the MCAT that's like, do you consider a disadvantage? If you consider yourself disadvantaged, like, then mark that um, and explain yourself. Um, I know it's a weird question, but it's just the way that it's set up. And I know a lot of us will be like, well, there's, you know, I'm not that disadvantaged. There's a, people worse than me. But like, if you truly felt disadvantaged, then don't not check that. Um, and then, yeah, just echoing the same things. Just get your research, making sure you understand what you're getting yourself into. That's like the biggest thing that we try to see in the application process is like, do they know what this is about? Do they know that it's a long program? Do they know what's the end goal? And like just seeing the person, what do you want to become in the future? We want to know like, what do you, what do you see yourself as? Like, do you want to be like in industry? Do you want to be a, a faculty member? And do you want to own your own lab? Or do you just want to do a little bit of research? Just kind of, kind of knowing what you're getting yourself into. Um, so you're already in the minority, so you're already kind of standing out and just like have those other things on top of that, like solid. Um, doesn't have to be like exceptional, but just have them solid. Um, and if you have deficits, explain them. Uh, I also wanted, that was great advice from 
<laughs> both of you, but I, I also wanted to add that making sure that you feel supported at the um, institutions that you're applying to, that's something that uh, UCI has been talking a lot about amongst our students, especially in the wake of the George Floyd protests. We really wanted to you know, take a look at the institution. Look, we looked at our numbers. We looked at like, where are we losing um, like underrepresented applicants? And like, yeah, it, it's something that I think there's been like a lot of talk within our grad school, like not the med school, but within the grad school of how it's not just about like making the numbers and getting to that program, but also like feeling that continuity of support like from the institution once you're there like that you have mentors that other students are like looking out for you um and yeah like the institution should be taking all of these things into consideration already i know uh like as alejandra mentioned i know our admissions committee looks comprehensively at these things and like takes into account what sort of barriers you have um and and explaining it is a really really great way to make sure that you are are getting uh, noticed for the right reasons. Um, but yeah, additionally, it's like, you've already done all of this work or like you're presenting all of these things. Now is this institution uh, going to give you the support that you need and like how specifically and uh, making sure that you feel comfortable where you're going is really, really important. Okay, so I know we have about 10 minutes left. I want to be respectful of your time. So we'll try to squeeze in just a few more questions. Um, the next one is, I know MD PhD programs care a lot about research experiences and it's important to have various experiences, but how do you, how do you show equal enthusiasm for clinical work? And do these programs care about both research and clinical work equally? Um, in my experience, different programs care differently about both things. So I know some programs have a threshold um, of the minimum hours that you should have had experience for clinical exposure or volunteering. Um, some programs just look at it on a case-by-case -case based. Um, so it's going to vary. Different programs are looking for different things. Um, if I had to guess, I think research is weighted a lot more than the clinical side just because you're going to spend four years in a PhD program. Um, so as long as you can convey why medicine is essential for your MD PhD path and you have activities that support that. I know as pre-meds a lot of times we're all about um, quantity and I think the emphasis should be on quality. Can you talk about those experiences and can you explain how they inform your path? Um, and I think that's how I approach it. And I just want to say a quick note, um, at least as this pertains to non-traditional MSDPs, um, it really varies. The admissions committees themselves and how admissions decisions are made vary institution by institution. So for instance, at the University of Michigan, applying to the MSTP in a non-traditional PhD, you have to get accepted separately by the medical school and the MSCP and whatever department you're applying to. Um, I don't know if that's the case for basic science PhDs, but it's usually the case, sometimes the case. It really dif differs by school um, uh, when it comes to the social sciences and humanities. So again, do your research and talk to, sometimes they're not super transparent about it, but try to get a sense of how those decisions are made to try to get a better sense of what the expectations are. Right, so I can say like for UIC, um, you can get, I think there are even cases where you can get accepted by our program, the MSTP program and get rejected from the med school, but you'll still go, you can still go to the MD PhD because that outweighs things because you're not act like you're not being interviewed by the med school at my school but it differs everywhere um and so you have to yeah do your research um in regards to the question which was about a weighing clinical and research I think so 
I think with an MD PhD program, they already kind of assume that you care about the clinical aspect. They want to see some clinical experience um, just to confirm that. But I think the research is weighted more because you have to think that this is an investment in the person. Like this is an invest. Like it's it's a lot. It's actually a lot of money per applicant or per uh, student. Um, for the program and um, a lot of people actually want to do the MD and some people do the MD and then they drop out um, from the PhD portion so they want to make sure that you're actually there for the MD and the PhD and not just there to get like your first two years of MD paid for or like you know, kind of weird things like that. So I think the research is weighted just a little bit more just to verify and confirm that like you do, you want the PhD and in the end you're gonna be a clinician scientist um, in whatever regard um, you started off with. But um, that, that's how I think they see it. Um, they, but if you don't have any clinical experience, at least at my school, they do kind of question as well. Um, but I think if you had like zero research experience, that would be far worse, so. Do we have any last question? Okay, so the last question would be, what are the do's and don'ts? Um, program, what are programs looking for in an applicant and how can we best showcase these qualities? Well, I have a do um, or a don't. Do be nice to the staff during your interview um, or don't be mean to the staff during your interview because they actually have a lot of weight so the people who you are emailing, like, be kind, things get reported. Um, we've definitely declined, we did decline someone who was just really rude to, you know, our administrator. So um, just know that be on your best behavior. I'm assuming a lot of you already are, but just FYI, everyone's listening, everyone's paying attention, no matter how high or low they are um, on that uh, Bracket. Okay. <laughs> I'd say a big one for me was um, do approach the progress, no, the process with an open mind. I know um, there were a lot of schools that I thought I would never want to do my MD PhD here, and then after the interview, I ended up really liking the program and, and the place. Um, so just be mindful that you know cast a white net so you have an opportunity to explore because sometimes you're pleasantly surprised and you end up finding a place that is perfect for you that you never thought um, would even make your list. Um, I would probably say really dig into like who you are and what is it that you're trying to get out of this like why do you want to be in this program? It's super long. Everybody's going to question you on it. And like, if you feel like you have an answer that you can really hold on to um, and present that, like share that while you're at the school, like while you're interviewing um, or on the essay, like in these different situations. Um, imagine someone close to you were, were asking you, like, why would you want to do this thing? And come up with those reasons that you would explain to them. Um, and I think that like remembering that, especially when you are interviewed, they want you there and sort of carrying a little bit of like, you know, um, imposter syndrome was talked about earlier. And I think many of us feel that in this field, um, you have put in the hours, you've done a lot of work to get where you're going. So just allow yourself to showcase that and you deserve to showcase that. Don't be bashful. Um, you deserve. <laughs> um, and another do I would add again to like the non-traditional side of things is definitely reach out to faculty. Um, I think that's even more critical on the non-traditional side because it's not like a 
we don't do rotations among labs. We don't have a PI, um, but we generally, you know, oftentimes there's, it's advantageous if there are faculty in the program who have a sense of who you are and what you're interested in doing and can kind of understand where you might fit within their own research. Um, so they can sort of, you know, make an effort to get you in um, if they want you there. So that is something to think about ahead of time, right? So you, again, like another big do is to kind of trace back month by month what you need to accomplish by whatever deadline there is. Um, so you want to be reaching out to faculty like sooner than later. Um, definitely, you know, not, you know, by the time that you're submitting your secondaries, like that's kind of a little too late. So you want to like retrace your steps and really think in advance. Um, well, with that, I want to thank our speakers for your time. Uh, this was an awesome event. I never considered the MD PhD route and then I'm hearing you guys and it's like, damn it, I should have considered it before. But um, thank you again for your time. Um, again, a reminder for our attendees, our speakers have a profile on me mentor. I know there's one email contact missing at the end of the survey. So we will um, send an email with all the contact information um, or the, the complete in information uh, um, in the next two days, just to give you guys time to uh, finish the, the post event survey. Um, again, please take the two to three minutes to give us feedback. Um, we can do this event again if you guys are like requesting for it more. Um, this is just um, based on demand. And um, thank you so much. I, I don't have anything else to say. Um, so we can all log off. And um, thank, thank you, you. Again for your time. Thank Thanks you, everyone. everyone.